Welcome to Gospel Truth with Andrew Womack, a teaching ministry that focuses on God's unconditional love and grace. We have a better covenant upon better promises, and we have a better relationship with God. We were at such a desperate place that Andrew, it was like life. It was just life that was coming from the television. And every area in our life has been turned right side up. And now, here's Andrew. Welcome to our Wednesday's broadcast of The Gospel Truth. Today, I'm continuing to teach on a subject that I've entitled, The War Is Over. This is based on Luke chapter 2, verse 14, where the angels uh, were singing and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace, goodwill towards men. This isn't peace among men, but peace from God towards men. The war is over. And that's what this book is all about. I'm now into the middle of my fourth week of teaching, and next week will be the end of this series. And I tell you, I've already covered a lot of really important things. This week, I've been talking about the difference between the Old and the New Covenant. Because lots of times when you talk about the grace of God and you talk about God not holding our sins against us and Him being merciful to our unrighteousness, as it says in Hebrews chapter uh, 8 and other places, People immediately say, but wait a minute, and they will cite Old Testament examples of like God striking Miriam with leprosy because she came out against Moses about the, you know, the punishments of Deuteronomy chapter 28 where it says that if you don't keep the law, then you will get all of these curses and all of these things will come upon you. And they will cite things like that and they'll say, how can you sit here and talk about that God is just gracious towards people when they deserve judgment? And they will go back and look at the Old Testament examples of God's wrath. What I'm trying to do this week is to show you that the wrath of the Old Testament has been done away with for those who accept the atonement of the Lord Jesus Christ under the New Covenant. Now, the wrath of God is still there if a person doesn't accept the New Covenant. But for those who are in the New Covenant, the wrath of God was placed upon Jesus, and we have a New Covenant. The word covenant means it's like a contract. God has a new way of dealing with us. And sad to say, the average Christian has not understood this, so they mix the Old Covenant and the New Covenant together, and as a result, they come up with this uh, image of God that He's uh, at the very least, schizophrenic. Like, is he the God of the Old Covenant where the wrath of God is going to come upon you for you've done something wrong? Or is he going to be the God of the New Covenant where you turn around and forgive a, very, a woman taken in the very act of adultery? And they think that God is schizophrenic and they aren't sure how to relate to God. But God has not changed. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. But his dealings with us have changed because he placed our punishment upon His Son, Jesus. And He placed all of His wrath. I've already used those verses out of John chapter 12, verse 32, where all of the wrath, all of the judgment of God came upon Jesus. And there isn't any judgment left against those who have accepted this new covenant. Not because God changed, but because He placed His wrath for our sins. Past, present, and even future sins have been placed upon Jesus, and because of that, He can deal with us in mercy. But if you are trying to still bring the old covenant over into the new covenant relationship with God, it will pollute the whole thing, and it will make you feel that God must be mad at you because you will see examples of this under the old covenant. So let me show you again. We're talking about that there is a difference between this old covenant law and the new covenant grace. And in Romans chapter 5, in verse 13, here is one radical statement that when I first saw this, it just put me on my heels. It made me uh, confused for a long period of time until I began to get some revelation. But in verse 13, it says, For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. What a radical statement. Sin is not imputed when there is no law. And this is talking specifically about the law of Moses. If I had time, you would have to study the entire book of Romans, but the book of Romans 
IS PAUL'S MASTERPIECE ON GETTING PEOPLE AWAY FROM THE OLD TESTAMENT LAW OF MOSES AND INTO THE NEW TESTAMENT MERCY AND GRACE THAT THE LORD JESUS CHRIST BROUGHT. SO THE LAW HERE IS TALKING SPECIFICALLY ABOUT THE LAW OF MOSES. NOW THE LAW OF MOSES WAS GIVEN ABOUT 2,000 YEARS AFTER THE FALL OF ADAM AND EVE. AND SO THIS VERSE IS SAYING, THAT UNTIL THE LAW, UNTIL THE TIME THAT MOSES GAVE THESE COMMANDMENTS AND BROUGHT IN THE OLD TESTAMENT COVENANT OF LAW, THAT GOD WAS NOT IMPUTING MEN'S SINS UNTO THEM. THE WORD IMPUTE MEANS TO HOLD AGAINST, TO PUT TO YOUR ACCOUNT, TO RECORD AGAINST YOU. IT'S AN ACCOUNTING TERM. And it, AND IT LITERALLY MEANS TO PUT ON THE BOOKS, TO JUST WRITE IT DOWN. YOU KNOW, IF YOU WENT INTO A STORE AND uh, YOU GAVE THEM, LIKE, FOR INSTANCE, YOUR CREDIT CARD. YOUR CREDIT CARD HAS INFORMATION ON THERE THAT ALLOWS THEM TO IMPUTE THAT, that SALE TO YOU, AND YOU LATER HAVE TO PAY IT. BUT IF SOMETHING HAPPENED AND THEY NEVER IMPUTED IT UNTO YOU, THEN IT WOULD BE LIKE YOU NEVER OWED IT. AND THIS IS SAYING THAT GOD WAS NOT IMPUTING. HE WAS NOT RECORDING. HE WAS NOT HOLDING PEOPLE'S SINS AGAINST THEM UNTIL THE TIME THAT THE LAW WAS GIVEN. NOW, SEE, THIS IS A TOTALLY DIFFERENT ATTITUDE THAN WHAT MOST PEOPLE HAVE. HERE'S THE ATTITUDE THAT I WAS BROUGHT UP WITH. OVER IN GENESIS, CHAPTER 3, WHEN ADAM AND EVE SINNED, AND IT SAYS IN GENESIS, CHAPTER 3, IN VERSE 22, IT SAYS, THE LORD GOD SAID, BEHOLD, THE MAN HAS BECOME AS ONE OF US TO KNOW GOOD AND EVIL, AND NOW, LEST HE PUT FORTH HIS HAND AND TAKE ALSO OF THE TREE OF LIFE AND EAT AND LIVE FOREVER, THEREFORE THE LORD GOD SENT HIM FORTH FROM THE GARDEN TO TILL THE GROUND FROM WHENCE HE WAS TAKEN. AND HE DROVE OUT THE MAN, AND HE PLACED AT THE EAST OF THE GARDEN OF EDEN CHERUBIMS AND A FLAMING SWORD WHICH TURNED EVERY WAY TO KEEP THE WAY OF THE TREE OF LIFE. THE WAY THAT I WAS TAUGHT THIS WAS THAT WHEN MAN SINNED, HERE WAS HOLY GOD, AND NOW MAN HAD BECOME UNHOLY, AND GOD COULD NOT HAVE ANYTHING TO DO WITH UNHOLY MAN, AND SO HE EXPELLED ADAM AND EVE FROM HIS PRESENCE BECAUSE HE COULDN'T JUST TOLERATE THEIR UNHOLINESS. AND I BET YOU THAT THE MAJORITY OF PEOPLE WHO ARE WATCHING THIS PROGRAM HAVE THAT ATTITUDE. AND YET, THAT'S NOT WHAT THESE VERSES ARE SAYING. MATTER OF FACT, IF YOU COUPLE THIS WITH ROMANS CHAPTER 5, VERSE 13, IT SAYS, UNTIL THE TIME THAT THE LAW WAS GIVEN, GOD WASN'T IMPUTING MAN'S SINS UNTO THEM. THAT MEANS HE WASN'T HOLDING THEIR SINS AGAINST THEM. HE WAS NOT PUNISHING THEM FOR THEIR SINS. AND MAN, I CAN GIVE YOU A LOT OF EXAMPLES OF THAT. BUT RIGHT HERE IN THE FOURTH CHAPTER, YOU FIND WHERE CAIN KILLED HIS BROTHER ABEL, AND INSTEAD OF GOD'S WRATH COMING UPON HIM. NOW, THERE WERE CONSEQUENCES FOR HIS SIN. AND THIS IS IMPORTANT THAT YOU UNDERSTAND THAT EVEN THOUGH GOD ISN'T JUDGING SIN, THERE'S STILL CONSEQUENCES TOWARDS SIN. IT'S WHAT I CALL A VERTICAL AND A HORIZONTAL EFFECT OF SIN. THE VERTICAL EFFECT IS GOD'S WRATH. ROMANS CHAPTER 5, VERSE 13, AND VERSES FOLLOWING, SHOW THAT UNTIL THE TIME THAT THE LAW WAS GIVEN, GOD WASN'T RELEASING HIS PUNISHMENT AND HIS WRATH UPON MAN'S SIN. SO THIS VERTICAL EFFECT OF SIN WAS NOT BEING RELEASED BY GOD AGAINST THE HUMAN RACE. BUT DOES THAT MEAN THAT THERE WAS NO CONSEQUENCES? NO, BECAUSE THERE'S THIS HORIZONTAL EFFECT. IN ROMANS CHAPTER 6, VERSE 16 SAYS, KNOW YE NOT THAT TO WHOM YE YIELD YOURSELVES, HIS SERVANTS YE ARE TO WHOM YE OBEY, WHETHER OF SIN UNTO DEATH OR OF OBEDIENCE UNTO GOD. EVEN THOUGH GOD WASN'T BRINGING HIS PUNISHMENT AGAINST OUR SINS UNTIL THE TIME THAT THE LAW WAS GIVEN, SIN WAS STILL DESTROYING PEOPLE'S LIVES BECAUSE OF THIS HORIZONTAL EFFECT. WHEN YOU LIVE IN SIN, YOU GIVE SATAN INROAD INTO YOUR LIFE. YOU YIELD YOURSELF TO SATAN. And, AND JOHN CHAPTER 10, VERSE 10 SAYS THAT THE THIEF COMETH NOT BUT FOR TO STEAL, TO KILL, AND TO DESTROY. IF YOU YIELD YOURSELF TO SATAN, I GUARANTEE YOU HE IS GOING TO EAT YOUR LUNCH AND POP THE BAG. SO EVEN THOUGH THERE WASN'T THIS VERTICAL EFFECT OF SIN, GOD'S WRATH WAS NOT BEING VENTED AGAINST MEN, THERE WAS A HORIZONTAL EFFECT. SATAN WAS GAINING INROAD INTO PEOPLE'S LIVES, AND BECAUSE OF THAT, PEOPLE WERE DYING BECAUSE OF THE SIN. SATAN WAS THE ONE WHO ENFORCED THAT DEATH. 
Now see, this is exactly what it says in Romans chapter 5, verse 13. It says, For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. And then the next verse says, Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come. What's it saying? It's saying that if God wasn't uh, imputing man's sins, if He wasn't punishing men for His sins until the time of Moses, well, then why did people die? Because sin has a twofold effect. Not only was it a transgression against God, but it was also an invite, an invitation for the devil into your life, and he comes only to steal, to kill, and to destroy. So even though God's wrath was not being poured out upon our sin, Satan was destroying people, and they were dying. Did you know that when Adam and Eve first transgressed, Adam lived to be 930 years old. One of his descendants, Methuselah, lived to be 969 years old. People lived nearly a thousand years in the beginning. They had so much life in them when God created them that it took sin a long time to begin to start destroying man's life. But you can look and men's lives begin to start systematically declining. It took a while for sin to pervert and to corrupt this perfect creation that God had created. But men's lives begin to start being decreased. And then he said in the sixth chapter after the a flood, he says, man's years will be 120 years. That wasn't a maximum because you can see that Noah, right there, the one of the ones that the Lord spoke to, he lived to be 600 and something years old, and Abraham lived to be 175 years old. So 120 wasn't a maximum, it was a minimum. In other words, sin. God wasn't releasing His judgment on sin at that time, but sin was destroying the human race, and instead of God placing a maximum of 120 years, He placed a minimum of 120 years on man's life just in mercy towards them. Because if He hadn't have done that, man would have started being destroyed at a much younger age. You know, I was just reading something yesterday and it wasn't just too many years ago, a hundred and something years, two hundred years ago, that it was not unusual for people's lifespan to only be 25 to 30 years, 45 years old. You know, during the revolution, during the time of the 1700s in America, uh, the average lifespan was somewhere around 30 years old. Now, that's because there was a high infant mortality rate and that brought the average down. But still, a person who was 50 years old or 60 years old was really old back in the 1700s and stuff. And, and things have changed. Praise God. There's multiple reasons for it. But the lifespan of man was decreasing. Even though God wasn't bringing His judgment upon our sins, Satan was destroying man. And if God hadn't a place to limit on it, uh, people would have been dying at a very, very young age. And so I say all of this to say that when, when God wasn't imputing man's sins unto them, some people think, well, then why then do we have problems? Why do you die? Why do you have anything? Because there's an enemy out there that takes advantage. Even if God doesn't punish sin, Satan is going to punish sin. Satan will take advantage of you. So there is a reason not to live in sin even if God isn't placing His wrath upon you. But here came Cain, and Cain killed his brother. And instead of God's wrath coming upon Cain, God instead placed a mark upon Cain and protected him because Cain was af afraid. And he says, every person that's going to hear about this is going to seek to kill me. And so God protected the first murderer on the face of the planet. Now contrast that with after the law was given, the first person who broke the law of Moses was a man who did not observe the commands about the Sabbath. And he went out and he gathered sticks on the Sabbath day, which God told him not to do any work on the Sabbath day. But this man went out and gathered sticks so that he could make a fire and cook him some food. And, when, and it was told Moses what had happened, so Moses put him in jail and sought the Lord for an answer. All right, this man has broken the law. What is the punishment? And the glory of God, the visible cloud of God, appeared, and an audible voice came out of the cloud and said, Kill him. 
MAKE AN EXAMPLE OUT OF HIM, STONE HIM TO DEATH. SO THE FIRST PERSON WHO BROKE THE LAW WAS PUT TO DEATH FOR JUST PICKING UP STICKS AND MAKING A FIRE ON THE SABBATH DAY. THE FIRST PERSON WHO TRANSGRESSED ad AFTER ADAM AND EVE WAS CAIN THAT KILLED HIS BROTHER, AND INSTEAD OF HIM BEING PUT TO DEATH, HE WAS EXTENDED MERCY. NOW, AGAIN, THAT'S NOT TO SAY THAT GOD THOUGHT THAT HIS SIN WAS OKAY. NO, IT WAS WRONG, AND THERE WERE CONSEQUENCES TO IT. BUT INSTEAD OF GOD'S WRATH BEING POURED OUT UPON HIM, GOD WAS NOT IMPUTING HIS TRESPASSES UNTO HIM, JUST EXACTLY THE WAY THAT ROMANS 5.13 SAYS. GOD STARTED EXTENDING MERCY TOWARDS PEOPLE. AND FOR APPROXIMATELY 2,000 YEARS AFTER THE FALL OF ADAM, GOD WAS NOT GIVING MEN WHAT THEY DESERVED. HE WAS DEALING WITH THEM IN MERCY, NOT IMPUTING THEIR TRESPASSES UNTO THEM. ABRAHAM MARRIED HIS HALF-SISTER. SARAH WAS A HALF-SISTER. AND ACCORDING TO LEVITICUS CHAPTER 18, YOU COULD NOT HAVE A HALF-SISTER AS A WIFE. IF YOU DID, IT WAS AN ABOMINATION, AND THEY HAD TO BE CUT OFF. THE WORD CUT OFF IN EXODUS CHAPTER 31, VERSE 14, I BELIEVE IT IS, IT MAKES IT VERY CLEAR THAT THAT MEANS PUT TO DEATH. YOU HAD TO CUT THEM OFF. SO ABRAHAM, IF HE WOULD HAVE BEEN LIVING UNDER THE LAW, HE WOULD HAVE BEEN PUT TO DEATH BECAUSE HE HAD A HALF-SISTER FOR HIS WIFE. THAT WAS A SEXUAL ABOMINATION, AND YET GOD CALLED ABRAHAM HIS FRIEND, A MAN WHO, IF HE HAD BEEN LIVING UNDER THE LAW, WOULD HAVE BEEN PUNISHED. ABRAHAM ALSO LIED ABOUT HIS WIFE, SARAH, AND SAID, SHE'S JUST MY SISTER. WELL, SHE WAS A SISTER. SHE WAS A HALF-SISTER, BUT ANY WAY YOU SLICE THIS, ABRAHAM WAS NOT uh, GIVING THE RIGHT PROTECTION TOWARDS HIS WIFE. SHE WAS SO BEAUTIFUL THAT IN HER 70s, SHE WAS, he, uh, ABRAHAM WAS AFRAID SOMEBODY WAS GOING TO KILL HIM TO BE ABLE TO GET TO HIS WIFE. AND THEN HE DID IT AGAIN WHEN SARAH WAS 90. HE WAS AFRAID SHE WAS SO BEAUTIFUL AT 90 THAT SOMEBODY WOULD KILL HIM TO BE ABLE TO TAKE SARAH. MAN, SHE WAS ONE GOOD-LOOKING WOMAN TO BE 90 YEARS OLD AND HIM AFRAID THAT PEOPLE WERE GOING TO KILL HIM TO GET TO HIS WIFE. AND SO TWICE, ABRAHAM LIED. AND HE SAYS, SHE'S JUST MY SISTER. SHE WASN'T JUST HIS SISTER. SHE WAS A HALF-SISTER, BUT SHE WAS HIS WIFE. AND ANY WAY YOU SLICE THIS, ABRAHAM DID NOT DO THE RIGHT THING. ABRAHAM SINNED. IF HE WOULD HAVE BEEN UNDER THE LAW, THERE WOULD HAVE BEEN PUNISHMENT FOR HIM. AND YET, HE WAS THE FRIEND OF GOD. GOD BLESSED ABRAHAM. AND GOD ACTUALLY REBUKED KINGS FOR ABRAHAM'S SAKE. IN THE 12TH CHAPTER OF THE BOOK OF GENESIS, RIGHT AFTER GOD HAD MADE THIS COVENANT WITH ABRAM AND SAYS, I'M GOING TO MAKE YOUR CHILDREN AS THE STARS THAT ARE IN THE SKY. IF YOU, IF uh, ANYBODY COMES AGAINST YOU, THEY WILL BE CURSED. I'LL BLESS HIM THAT BLESSES YOU, AND I'LL CURSE HIM THAT CURSES YOU. RIGHT AFTER GOD MADE THAT COVENANT WITH ABRAHAM, ABRAHAM WENT DOWN INTO EGYPT, AND THAT'S WHERE PHARAOH uh, SET HIS EYES UPON uh, SARAH, AND HE TOOK SARAH INTO HIS CONCUBINES. HE DIDN'T HAVE SEXUAL RELATIONSHIPS WITH HER, BUT NONETHELESS, HE WAS PLANNING ON IT. HE TOOK HER AS A WIFE, AND THEN HE FOUND OUT THAT THIS WAS um, uh, A MAN'S WIFE, ABRAHAM'S WIFE. GOD REVEALED HIMSELF IN A DREAM AND TOLD HIM, YOU'RE BUT A DEAD MAN, BECAUSE THAT'S ANOTHER MAN'S WIFE. AND uh, GOD REBUKED PHARAOH. PHARAOH WASN'T THE ONE WHO WAS REALLY IN THE TRANSGRESSION. BACK IN THOSE DAYS, MULTIPLE WIVES WAS AN ACCEPTED THING. IT WASN'T PHARAOH WHO WAS WRONG. IT WAS ABRAHAM WHO WAS WRONG, AND YET WHO GOT REBUKED? IT WAS PHARAOH THAT GOT REBUKED BECAUSE HE DIDN'T HAVE A COVENANT WITH GOD. ABRAHAM HAD A COVENANT WITH GOD. GOD DEALS WITH US BASED ON COVENANT, NOT INDIVIDUAL ACTIONS. BOY, THAT IS SOMETHING THAT THE AVERAGE PERSON DOES NOT UNDERSTAND. AND IT'S BECAUSE WHEN THE OLD TESTAMENT LAW WAS GIVEN, THEN GOD DID DEAL WITH US BASED ON INDIVIDUAL ACTIONS. ACTUALLY, HE WAS STILL DEALING WITH US BASED ON A COVENANT. AND IN THAT OLD TESTAMENT COVENANT, THERE WERE SACRIFICES THAT YOU COULD MAKE THAT WOULD ATONE FOR THOSE INDIVIDUAL ACTIONS. BUT NONETHELESS, THE ACTIONS WERE AMPLIFIED. AND I'LL BE DEALING WITH THIS MORE AS WE GO THROUGH IT. BUT GOD DEALT WITH ABRAHAM IN MERCY BECAUSE HE HAD GIVEN HIM THIS COVENANT. AS A GENERAL RULE, GOD WAS NOT IMPUTING MEN'S TRESPASSES UNTO THEM.
until the time that the law came. Abraham was living in what Leviticus chapter 18, a part of the law said was a sexual abomination punishable by death. And, but instead of Abraham being punished, he was called the friend of God. And then you can see Abraham's grandson, Jacob, that came along. And Jacob mar married Rachel and Leah, who were sisters, and he had both of them as wives. And according to Leviticus 18, that is a sexual abomination, and they had to be killed. And yet, instead of Jacob being killed, he wrestled with an angel and prevailed. And the angel blessed him and changed his name from Jacob to Israel, and he became the father of all of the Israelites. So here was a man that if he had been living under the law, he would have been condemned to death. And yet, because the law hadn't come yet, God was actually showing mercy and grace towards Jacob, and Jacob became this mighty man of God, one of the patriarchs of the nation of Israel. If they had been living under the law, they would have been judged. They wouldn't have been blessed. See, this is the way that God wanted to deal with things. He could have given His law to Adam and Eve in the garden. The moment that they transgressed, He should have, could have given them the Ten Commandments right then. But He waited for 2,000 years because He didn't want to impute our sins unto us. He wanted to be merciful unto us. Boy, this is important that you understand this. The law was not the first way that God dealt with us. He did not give Adam and Eve the law. He didn't expel Adam and Eve out of the garden because He hated them and couldn't tolerate them. No, it says right here in Genesis chapter 3, He says, Now, lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever, therefore the Lord God sent him forth. The reason God sent Adam and Eve out of the garden wasn't because He was holy and they were unholy and He couldn't fellowship with them anymore. No, it was because He didn't want them to eat of the tree of life and live forever. And some people think, well, that's a terrible thing. No, it was actually a good thing. And you know, I probably don't have time on today's program to explain this adequately. But once you understand what God intended for us to be before sin entered. And then once you understand what He has purchased for us, that we are going to live forever in eternity in a mansion in the presence and the glory of God where there will be no more sorrow, no more crying, no more pain. If you really understood those things, then you would understand that living forever, if, you, if they had eaten of this tree and if they could live forever in a fallen world, where sickness and disease and depression and grief and anger and bitterness and unforgiveness and all of these things are dominant, that would be punishment. God provided something better for us. Death wasn't a part of His original plan, and if we had not sinned, there wouldn't have been death. But once we did sin, death is actually a good thing. Because for those who will receive the salvation that is offered through Jesus, death ushers us into an eternity that is going to be so much greater. It says that the former things won't even come to mind. It's going to be awesome. Man, I'm out of time today. I'll take up on this tomorrow. I encourage you to please get this teaching on The War Is Over. This book is in English. I also have it in Spanish. I have CDs. I have DVDs. And we have study guides that is the same teaching, just reformatted so that you can teach it in a Bible study situation. It would be a great truth to share with other people. Listen to our announcer as he gives you information about how to receive these materials, and please call or write today.